So uh, here we are again, uh, another one of the Influence podcasts, and I'm delighted to be joined by Karen Spencer from the wonderful Waylar Influencer Marketing Agency or platform. You're a bit of everything, really, aren't you? Indeed. We <laughs> are a, a tech-driven agency, let's say that. A, a tech-driven agency. Yeah. So um, I'd love to know a little bit about, about your background. Of course, you're... Um, you're not. Uh, we're not doing this podcast from uh, the UK. You're living in uh, sunny Los Angeles, aren't you? Yes, indeed. Um, I started uh, originally in Hollywood as an assistant for a talent agent. Uh, that's what they tell you when you move to Hollywood that you have to start out that way. And after a few years, I became a talent agent myself. And I realized in that process that I needed creativity to keep me interested in my job. And um, I kind of thought being an agent was going to be like having these lunches with directors and talking about their script and then pitching my actors, but it was not like that at all. It was really um, very administrative. And so I started telling um, folks that I had met here that I was looking for something more interesting. And that led me to a meeting with Ashton Kutcher, who at the time was on that 70s show and was producing and starring in Punked uh, and had decided to build a production company from the ground up. So I left my job as a talent agent and went to work for him as his assistant. And I did that for three years as we built his production company. And then I became his vice president of production. And we had three different uh, sections of the company, film, television, and what we called new media back then, because mm -hmm. Ashton said, I think there's a way to make money on the internet, but I'm not sure yet how to do that. <laughs> um, but he was, as I'm sure you know, really interested in the startup world. And um, so one day he said, there's a thing called Twitter. And I want to become the first person on Twitter with a million followers. And I had been at that time in the edit bay working on uh, post-production on one of his films for a number of months. And so all of a sudden this was a really exciting new venture, um, one that brought me out of the bay. And uh, he challenged CNN to a duel sort of to see if he or CNN would be the first to reach a million followers. And the point there was that because of the internet and social platforms now, it's possible for one person to have the same amount of impact um, as a giant company. And mm. so he actually just barely beat CNN um, to a million. We broke into the CNN building in Atlanta, climbed up on the roof and draped at A plus K banners over the whole building. Um, I had written uh, a lawyer's number on my arm because I was sure that we were going to be arrested. Um, but in fact, the helicopters flying above us were uh, not police, but they were CNN helicopters covering the whole story. Uh, and Oprah invited us onto her show to teach her about Twitter. And it was such an immediate gratification that I realized um, that was what I wanted to focus on more moving forward, social media. Uh, so after working for Ashton for five years, I, I actually moved to Thailand for six months, took some time off, had a little bit of a reset. And then when I came back, I, I moved to New York and um, he had been friends with uh, Puffy, Puff Daddy, P. Diddy, however you want to call him. Right. And so I started working in hip hop and um uh, worked at a, a hip hop management company called Violator, led by the late, great Chris Lighty. And um, I advised all of his hip hop musicians on how to take control and manage their social media pages. So 50 Cent, Buster Rhymes, Mariah Carey, Puffy, all kinds of interesting um, and, and very uh, dynamic characters uh, and profiles and brands to build on social. Uh, from there, I went to work for Tyra Banks. I was her director of communications and I did My all goodness. of those same wow. types of things, uh, setting up her social media presence. And from there, I went to the first ever influencer agency called The Audience. And that was founded by Ari Emanuel. You, you and your audience might know Ari as um, his character from Entourage. Uh, mm. So he was 
one of the biggest agents in town at the time and all of his celebrity clients were asking him, how do I manage my social media? Uh, so he, along with Sean Parker from Facebook and Oliver Luckett created this agency called The Audience to manage the social pages of all of their celebrity clients. After about a year, it became clear that that wasn't um, really a business model that could drive great profits because any celebrity wants to pay $5,000 a month, maybe max for um, their social media pages to be managed. So we pivoted towards working with brands and we started explaining to brands that we represented these celebrities and we could put them together uh, for campaigns. But it actually turned out that that was right around the time that digital creators uh, were starting to emerge on social media. And so when, I, when you hear me talk about talent, I'll say traditional talent, and that means people who came to fame on film, television, or through music, uh, or digital creators, uh, and those are people who came to fame uh, via the internet, oftentimes just kids making videos in their bedrooms. Mm. And those two groups of talent often um, can find really interesting intersectionality, but they behave very differently, especially mm. on social. Mm. And um, what we started to find is that when we worked with digital creators for brands, that the results were much greater often, especially when compared to how much you had to pay them for their work. So we started to move towards um, focusing on working with digital creators primarily. And it was then that uh, Vine came calling. So uh, Twitter owned Vine and I went to work for them as their head of creators. And that was about uh, two years into the platform when uh, Instagram video had just launched and Vine saw a huge drop off in their engagement and their daily active users. And so they wanted to take a deep dive and really um, unpack how they were managing digital creators on their platforms. And I built a global uh, talent strategy to re-engage digital creators with Vine. Um, and I think we all know how that turned out. Uh, it was a really great um, experience and a great uh, year and a half there, but unfortunately um, not enough to turn the tide. And I think the big learning there for everyone uh, is that Vine never monetized. Vine never offered creators the opportunity to make money. And as we're seeing um, kind of every social media platform catch up to the awakening that if a creator wakes up and uh, has to decide how to spend their time every day. And there is a platform that wants them to post their content on it, but there is no way for them to make money. Uh, that platform is not going to succeed. Mm. So um, from Vine, I moved back to Los Angeles and became a vice president at at and where I led marketing efforts for uh, millennial and Gen Z consumers. And from there, I was the head of celebrity and influencer partnerships at Target. And I was at Target when Whaler came um, to pitch me uh, to be my influencer agency there. And because I had worked at the first ever influencer agency, I had plenty of opinions and um, started telling them, well, you need to do this and you need to do this and you need to have this. And they said, we have that and we are doing that. And here, <laughs> we'll show you. And um, I was just so impressed. I felt like this is really the future that mm. um, Whaler is living in and I want to be a part of it. So. I joined uh, about a year ago as their SVP of partnerships. And um, as of January, 2021, I will be their global chief marketing officer. Wow, yeah, what, what, a, what an insightful bio, I have to say, that's, uh, that's amazing, but it certainly well, gives you- It's getting to be quite long. I've had 31 jobs and I, I'm exhausted. <laughs> <laughs> well, good for you, but in many ways, it just, uh, what it's, done is is it's proven that uh, you've got to um, you've got to earn your stripes haven't you to be successful in this it's more competitive than ever before um, there's more creators that are coming online um, and we were just talking before we did the record about the the phenomena which is TikTok um, and and you know we know it's one of the most um, downloadable apps in 2019 and 2020 and I think with all of the challenges that we've had last year, um, I'd love to get your perspective on how you think TikTok has had a profound impact on influencer marketing. Uh, well, I think my favorite tweet that I read was Vine walked so TikTok could run. 
And I think that's actually so true. And one of the reasons that I'm a really big fan of TikTok and love to see what they've built over there because they actually studied the failure of Vine as well as all other social platforms to come up with what their offering would be uh, post musically. And I, you know, I think anybody who's been on TikTok and if someone listening to this hasn't been on TikTok, download and try it immediately. Um, But I think if you've been on TikTok, you understand that the real success in that app lies in the algorithm and um, it can start to predict what you will want to watch uh, really quickly. And I found that with other social platforms, uh, it, it can take up to two months to get your feed the way you want it to, to get who you're following the way you want it to be. And in TikTok, I think they've ramped that up, r- ramped that down to about a week. And um, especially if you hit like on videos that you like, there's also a, an opportunity to long hold on a video and a little screen will pop up and you can click not interested, which I have found is a way to kind of supercharge your algorithm. If you immediately tell uh, TikTok when you don't like a video that you're viewing, mm. uh, then you'll never see something like that again. So mm. If you are one of those people who thinks that TikTok is just about teenagers dancing, uh, it might be that you haven't told TikTok that that's not the content that you want to see. Uh, Because I, as a 43-year-old woman, I see, for the most part, um, really fascinating DIY construction TikToks. Um, I I mean, I was just watching somebody spray paint their house this weekend. It was very satisfying (laughs) and um, a lot of art projects, uh, just like beautiful, you know, paintings and knit pieces and just all kinds of arts and crafts. And I also love uh, animal videos, who doesn't? And uh, so I find that if I open TikTok now and just have 15 minutes to give it that uh, two hours later, I'll be asking myself (laughs) what happened because I just get trapped in this endless loop of entertainment. And that's the point really, right? Is to be entertained. And uh, TikTok's stated mission is to encourage creativity and joy. And I think unlike other social media platforms, my personal experience when I'm on TikTok is that I do really feel connected to people who are creative and also feel quite joyful when I'm finished. Unlike, let's say, I mean, Twitter, which I love and I'm on every day, but Twitter makes me angry because that's where politics are discussed. Yeah. And um, so I usually leave Twitter wanting to like tell somebody, did you hear about this? Did you hear what happened today? (laughs) Um, And it leaves me kind of feeling stressed out, whereas TikTok leaves me feeling happy. Yeah, I know it's definitely an entertainment uh, channel, isn't it? Um, I mean, what what are the sort of standout campaigns that you've noticed on TikTok that have really resonated, particularly in 2020? Well, we work a lot with hashtag campaigns, and that's what we recommend to our brand clients that they focus on. Certainly, there is a case to be made for sort of an always on um, constant steady drumbeat of content being produced. And if that is your um, content strategy, then we would recommend that you work with a group of TikTok creators uh, in a long-term partnership and they become your creators on the platform. But if you're looking to make a quick splash for a tent pole moment, a hashtag challenge is a real quick way to um, be seen by a lot of people. The most recent one that we've worked on is uh, over 5 billion views at the moment. Um, So we've seen these rap reports that we give our brand clients move from numbers in the millions to the billions with TikTok. And um, something else that we're really excited about is the opportunity to create original music on the platform. So of course, there are always 10 to 20 top really high performing popular songs on the platform, but those can quite uh, quickly deplete your entire budget if you want to buy that license to use as a brand. And so we're actually taking a different approach and working with up and coming music producers who are spending a lot of time on the platform sort of studying what's working and what's not working. Mm. And, um, you know, as we say, we're bringing back the jingle. So we get a brand client to give us sort of their non-negotiables, the things that they would like to be captured in a song and then we work with a producer to create an original song 
that not only is used in the campaign on um, the particular hashtag campaign days, which are usually anywhere from three to five, but then the song continues to live on the platform and travels around long after your campaign is over. So you're still getting that audio recognition and your brand um, replay, even if it's just a light touch and it feels organic, it's still carrying on uh, long after the campaign. Mm, sounds really good. And of course, a lot of music artists will have found 2020 quite difficult, uh, genuinely, because they've not got the, the, the venues and the um, uh, that they would normally be uh, performing in. So uh, that, sound, that sounds really exciting and interesting. Yeah, um, I never thought that we would miss being crammed into a small venue and hanging out with other sweaty folks but i would give anything to too. be in the middle of a concert again me too me too i mean i love live music it just it, it, it it's not i think it's not just about the sound it's about the emotional connection more than anything else um and i think what when, when we uh, there's going to be some enormous great big party isn't there when when we can really get back to meeting and engaging with friends and others I get the feeling is that there's going to be a post COVID event of some sort and, and people are going to just go crazy for it because uh, being cooped up in these lockdowns isn't, isn't great for us all, is it? Uh, I think we'll all be so, so happy when this is over. And I just got a notification on my phone that these vaccines are looking closer and closer. So there is light at the end of the tunnel. Let's light hope. at the end of the tunnel. <laughs> um, I want to just ask you a little bit about, um, uh, audiences and um, you know because if you if you're looking at brands investing more in influencer marketing what they want to know they, they, they want to increase their audience and they want to obviously make sure that that what they're what they're promoting is reaching the right type of audience and I've always said that influencer marketing is one of the most powerful advertising media that there is when done well <laughs> and that's the only caveat I say because sometimes people don't work with professional influencer agencies don't work with influencer platforms and think that just by outreaching and speaking to uh, creators directly they'll always get the, the results that they want and sometimes of course they do but more often than not they don't I mean there's more analytics now isn't there than, than ever before and I'm sure we're going to see more of that in 2021 tell us more about your thoughts and what Wayla are doing yeah, all of the data shows that we are truly entering the age of the influencer and um, year over year brand budgets for influencer marketing are increasing. And also to your point, I think the efficacy of um, the, the conversion rates and the ability to measure the impact that influencer marketing has is becoming sharper and more clear um, in its definition. I do uh, really wish, you know, in a perfect world, I wish that big brands could just give influencer marketing a true, honest year to focus just on creative collaborations and then measure it all at the end of it. Unfortunately, I feel like a lot of companies, especially ones that are just getting involved in influencer marketing, they, they have one campaign and then they want to see the, the proven effects. And I don't know where that thinking comes from, maybe because we are living in such a digital age and um, it feels like we should be able to measure things more precisely. But you know, I, I like to remind clients, think of all those years that you spent on radio advertising and billboard advertising and newspaper advertising. You didn't know how to measure um, the effectiveness of all of that messaging. So why is it that influencers come under such a critical microscope and everyone immediately needs to see the direct ROI? Um, I, I know for a fact, because I have worked on the brand side as a brand client myself, that influencer marketing works when done well. I've seen the internal statistics and the conversion mm -hmm. rates, and I've never been more confident in influencer marketing. And one of the reasons that I joined Whaler, one of the things that I was the most excited about when evaluating the agency is that Wheeler conducted the first ever neurological study on the impact that influencer marketing has on the brains of audiences. Mm. So uh, there were, uh, in, in collaboration with a company called NeoReach, there were brainwave readers applied to audiences who were exposed to traditional film 
uh, and television advertisements when a brand was speaking at an audience. And then uh, there was a measurement around influencers speaking at the audience. There's also a priming effect if that person already knows and is familiar with the influencer speaking to them, but both types of influencer marketing were measured. Um, those who were familiar with the influencers and those were not. And what we saw in the brain waves of people who were watching television ads uh, was a blue and green uh, activity, which means very low creativity. And what we saw in the brain waves of people watching influencer ads was a 277% increase in creativity and an 87% increase in memorability. So wow. when we know that creativity drives emotion and emotion drives recall and recall drives sales, we have known that influencer marketing works and now we have the science to back it up because it's really, you know, we've never been in a, a more heightened time of feeling isolated mm. and human to human communication will win every time over brand to human communication even though we all know intrinsically that brands are just companies made up of people when there is just a a mother brand speaking at you your brain is not responding in the same way that you do when a human is talking to you. Mm. I think it's all about the authenticity of individuals as well. And we've always used that word in influencer marketing, haven't we? Transparency and authenticity. Um, people trust an influencer more often than not than their own uh, friends and family uh, because of that they are engaging, they understand them, they are relatable. And so I think that's where brands have got massive opportunities to really work more with uh, influencers. But to the point that you made earlier, I, I couldn't concur with you more about this sort of short termism that some brands take. And I think it's up to us as an industry to really try and educate them into, you know, longer term ambassador programs where they're really immersed. I mean, if you think about it, an influencer wants a brand partnership to work. Because it's going Absolutely. to because actually if it falls flat on his face it doesn't it's it's no good for the influencer either, um, and uh, and the other thing I think about is these individuals are so talented you know they're not just they're not just got great audiences but they are you know photographers often videographers, um, I mean I'm sure you've seen some amazing content we were talking earlier weren't we about art and photography it's it's mind blowing isn't it. Um, yeah, hundred percent. And I think you're right on the money with everything that you just talked about. First of all, authenticity is hugely important and it does feel like it's a buzzword sort of band-aid about, but uh, it is not just paying lip service to that word. If you're not hiring influencers who actually are already organically in love with your brand, then you're not starting off in the right place. Um, you, you're not gonna have a meat eater promote vegan products and you're not going to have um, um, you know, someone who doesn't drive a car promote uh, your your new automobile. It just doesn't work, especially for those people who have been following that creator for a while. They will sniff it out and you will see it reflected in the comments right away. Mm. Um, like, oh, you just did this for the money. And so all of a sudden the audience is pulled out of the reason why they should be there and they're starting to criticize and pull apart the campaign. So um, authenticity, number one, absolutely. Uh, and to your point about long-term partnerships, I'm the hugest advocate of that. Um, I created the long-term partnership at Target called Target Talent, which is now entering its third year. And that has proven to be massively effective, effective for that company. And, you know, it's really all about connecting the creators to the company and the mission of the company. Mm -hmm. And um, in that previous conversation, we were having about the neurological impact um, that, that, sort of doesn't happen on brains when a brand is talking to them. I think very much uh, in the same way, the, the same thing happens with creators, right? If you're hired to uh, be an influencer for a campaign and what you receive to create that content is a cold, stale brief from a client, then you don't have the emotional connectivity to that company. But if you start your uh, partnership with the company by having a meeting with some of the top executives, by hearing 
what it is that they love about their jobs and what they love about their company, what the commitments to purpose-driven work are, because every company has a purpose-driven department at this point. And that is something that's really interesting to creators. Um, all of a sudden, they feel like they've put faces with the brand and they've understood sort of what makes that brand tick. And they do feel like they can more authentically speak about why uh, people should consider using this company's products. Mm. And um, that is a huge effort to undertake if it's a one-off campaign. But if you're hiring creators for six months or a year, then it makes a lot of sense to have everyone get to know each other and to really understand um, the do's and don'ts of the company's values and also uh, what the creator's comfortable with. And um, the first couple of months really become about a getting to know you process. And then once you've hit month three, month four, everyone's developed a shorthand. It becomes much easier. And then in terms of stickiness, we know that an audience is so trained now to see branded content that if they see it once, it's not likely to uh, remain in their brain for too long. But if you ask someone uh, after the end of six months, uh, you know, what, what brand would you associate with this creator? If they've been talking on a regular basis about the same brand, of course, course, that will be really sticky and the audience will be able to recall it immediately. Mm. So I think it works and makes a lot of sense and is the future of influencer marketing. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so what would be your sort of standout campaign that's really, um, you've really been impressed with over the last sort of 12 months? Well, um, I will tell you that internally at Whaler, what we've started doing is taking a scientific and data-driven approach from the beginning of campaigns. And we're seeing that have a great deal of effect on um, the outcome. So what I mean by that is, uh, I'll give you a couple of examples and I'll leave them anonymized because uh, we're just launching them now, um, but, uh, a tech client is launching a product in the market for college students, right? And um, as you mentioned previously, the sort of high level and quality of the work from digital creators these days, that's allowed us to really flip the entire agency model on its head and approach the client differently. Whereas I think it used to be the case that maybe there was a focus group with the intended um, demographic, the, the targeted demographic and maybe a creative agency would then take the output from that focus group and create a campaign. What we're doing now is actually utilizing the creators that we've hired for a campaign as not only the focus group, but then the content creators as well. So this is a, a college driven app and we hired 300 college students who were already top notch content creators because let's face it, college students are the perfect age, right? Mm. They've come up in that world. They yeah. have learned how to make content on their phones. Video and, um, and photos have been second nature to them their whole lives. And so we identified some of the most creative and most talented content creators as college students. And then we set up weekly meetings with this client to speak directly to the college students and ask them, you know, what are the needs that you have that aren't being met? does this campaign resonate with you or do you prefer this campaign? And, you know, what, what I found so amazing in these meetings is that oftentimes uh, the client has come with two choices for the college students and they have been so smart and brilliant in their feedback. Oftentimes they've said, neither one of those, here's what you should actually do. And they've been proactive and they've um, challenged the client to create uh, an entirely different type of campaign. And to the client's credit, they have made a lot of changes based on the feedback from the students. And so what we have in the market now um, is an authentic campaign, is a campaign created for the people it's intended to reach, by the people it was intended to reach. And uh, we're doing the same with a dating app. Uh, a dating app wanted to 
understand the needs of the LGBTQ community better. They felt like they were probably missing the mark a little bit because the executives were not representative of that community. And so again, we started um, with the community that they were intended to reach. And the results around um, those meetings with the client and the LGBTQ community were not only incredibly illuminating, but also quite dark, right? Like I learned some, um, some struggles that that community is having, especially on dating apps where, uh, you know, people, um, change their identities in order to target and harass these people and kind of get quite far down the the line in this sort of dating conversation before all of a sudden they come out as their, you know, horrible selves and really attack the people on the other end. So what we saw there was a lot of need for safety and protection that that community wasn't currently getting. And um, again, the client, it, it's really about being open-minded um, to like coming to these groups willing to learn and willing to throw out all of the previous assumptions that you had. And to this client's credit, they have completely thrown out their original playbook and they have leaned heavily into the feedback of this community. They're changing the product. And that is, you awesome. know, truly amazing when a, a marketing initiative can change the, the actual design of the product. Mm. Um, so that's the type of stuff that we're doing that is just really exciting. Well, I mean, that's fascinating stuff. I mean, if, we were just talking about other forms of media earlier, weren't we? And, you know, where do you get research back from a billboard, from a television or a radio? You know, this is what I think is so exciting about influencer marketing. It allows for really true and exciting insight. You know, if people aren't happy about you or your product, they're going to pretty much tell you straight away. Um, and, and brands will want to adjust their model accordingly. And, and you've just eliminated that really, really well. Um, that's super stuff. I'm just going to finish with uh, a question which I love to ask people, um, and that is, um, who influences you? That's a great question. <laughs> um, you know, I would say musically, I can't stop listening to James Blake. Um, every time I ask myself what I'm in the mood to listen to uh, is James Blake. Uh, I, I went on a really long stretch of just uh, absorbing and loving everything that Chance the Rapper was doing until he said that he wanted Kanye to be president. <laughs> so Chance and I, uh, we're going through some tough times right now. Um, artistically, you know, a lot of the talent that we work with um, at Whaler are really my sources of inspiration. Um, my personal passion is making sure to shine a spotlight on underrepresented groups. And I think 2020 has been such an important year, um, especially in America with the Black Lives Matter movement. And um, there are some real standout creatives who prior to this year um, had not had as much opportunity as they should have had. Um, and we are uh, taking a, a really a uh, deep look into making sure that we're representing um, as compared to the US census, uh, that we're over indexing representation in every way. So um, when we look to our, um, our campaigns and the people who are really performing well um, this year, I think a lot of it has to do with making sure that um, white people in America are taking a bit of a backseat and taking a moment to to listen and reflect on how we've all contributed to the systemic issues that we're facing today and um, how we can move forward um, more collectively and with love and empathy and understanding. Super lovely, lovely to hear from you. Karen Spencer, it's been a pleasure talking to you today. Thanks so much for having me. I appreciate it.